Welcome to Big Homeopathy. I'm your host, Sarah Thompson. Hi, welcome to Big Homeopathy. I'm the Big Homeopath, Sarah Thompson. So today, I want to start with the word polydispersity. That's shorthand for we are going to dork out. But before we do that, a little bit of an introduction. I've been thinking a lot this week about how to always be becoming a better homeopath and more of service. I am just lit up by creativity and entrepreneurship and excellence and the peaceful creation of value in this amazing world. And that's the thing that I want to be of service to. And so, you know, I'm always looking for resources and this amazing world of communication that we have now, I can always be finding so many people that are more knowledgeable, that are smarter uh, to learn from. You know, James Altucher talks about always standing next to the smartest person in the room, always recognizing that I am the dumbest person in the room and everyone else has more to teach me than I could know if, it, if I had a lifetime. And I love thinking about the world that way. I love waking up thinking about questions I could ask people and research projects and getting totally scattered. But anyway, so a colleague asked me this week, a friend who's a student said, what, how could I enhance my studies of homeopathy? Because of course you can't, in a 500 hour program, you can't possibly ever get to the depth of what you need to know. That's why the autodidacticism is so important. That's why that's where learning happens. And uh, it just so happens that this week I have been reading Dr. Manish Basha's lectures on Samuel Hahnemann's The Organ of Medicine. I remember my one of my first memories when I started studying homeopathy was of thinking, I am going to go broke buying all the books that I want to buy. And that has stayed, I still feel that way. The list of books that I want is longer than my wallet and I think that will always be true. But, you know, I think most of us start out our studies of homeopathy with the reading of the organon and raise your hand if that was baffling and befuddling for you. Uh, it certainly was for me. And Dr. Bosch's book is so helpful. In the first volume, he goes through aphorisms 1 through 70 and really helps you understand Hahnemann's philosophy of homeopathy, uh, really looking at what is to be cured in the patient, what is curative in medicines, and how do you make those two things meet? And toward the end of the book, he talks about something called hermesis. And I'm going to read the quote. He says, it is a term for generally favorable biological responses to low exposures, toxins, and other stressors, which in homeopathy, this relates to the aphorisms 63 through 66, which are about the primary and secondary action of, of medicines. And Dr. Weil has a, a description of, home, of hermesis that it's an overcompensation to reestablish homeostasis, which is a technical way of saying that an organism or group of them responds to small stresses by becoming more robust or numerous to adapt to a challenging environment. That's the end of the quote. So we all know this intuitively, that it's not about being in a bubble, that you need those um, adaptations to manageable stressors to grow and to increase in your adaptability. Kids should play in the dirt, we know this, but where homeopathy comes in is when the stressors are too big, when the adaptation isn't happening enough to uh, pull the body out of disease. And so in homeopathy, we're looking for that smallest possible, that minimum dose that is going to inspire that creative response, which brings me to nano nano. So I have this study, this following article is really cool. It should not be considered having to do with the mechanism of action of homeopathy. We're not talking about that. I read the other day that biologists didn't know for 70 years after the discovery of aspirin what the mechanism of action of aspirin is. We're not talking about the mechanism of action. We are talking about this spirit of inquiry that was on my mind because I was reading Hahnemann. Uh, and the, the inquiry in this study was an answer to the question, is there anything in homeopathic preparations that are diluted above Avogadro's number to the 300C and 200C level? And this team of uh, homeopaths in, team of researchers in India at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay um, did this study, I'll find the title for you. Extreme homeopathic dilutions retain starting materials, a nanoparticulate perspective. 
and they used transmission electron microscopy, electron diffraction, and chemical analysis to look at uh, a number of metal remedies, gold, silver, copper, tin, platinum, I think were the remedies that they looked at. And uh, so the short answer is yes, there's stuff in there. They found, even at that level, they found these nanoparticles. Uh, but uh, the key is uh, in succussion. And we know this, you know, that's so important when you're learning about homeopathic potentization is that it's not about the dilution alone. You know, if it were, then the skeptics who talk about a piece of sand in an o a universe of oceans would have a point. But it's about that rattling of the bones that happens with succussion, that uh, hard impact against a resistant but elastic surface that shakes things up. And there is a process that occurs called acoustic cavitation. This is all in the study, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but you should read it because it's really interesting, that these ultrasonic sound waves are created that create intense heat and actually fracture and change the shape of stuff uh, when this process happens. And so, you know, we understand that as clinicians when you see the difference between the way a patient will respond to a homeopathic preparation of argentum versus colloidal silver. But there's something else in this research that really caught my attention, and it was sort of, it wasn't their point at all, but it, it caught my eye, which was that they got these remedies from reputable pharmacies in India, and they did find a difference in, concentra in, in the amount of stuff in uh, the same potency of the same remedy from different pharmacies. And well, you know, there are sometimes some incidences of lower quality pharmacies where you would be concerned about the actual quality of the remedy. We, uh, you know, I don't think that's what's going on here. I think that what is going on in this case, because we do see that across reputable pharmacies, you will see this difference, that it's still not about the stuff. If it were just about the stuff, then each potency would have to have the same amount of the stuff to elicit the response. And, you know, I, I love the idea that this points to something way cooler than how much stuff is in the remedy, which is what is happening energetically. And can that be inspired and harnessed to create healing that does not come with side effects and suffering and all the things that uh, you know we associate with so much of conventional medicine and with palliative care? So I this is really cool. Check it out. I'll link it below and also this book, which you should read. And uh, that's what's big this week in big homeopathy. It's going to be huge. See you later.